Thanks for joining us for the Minor Tweak Major Impact podcast. We're excited to have Dr. Naomi Park as the guest for today's episode. Naomi is a senior staff scientist in the DNA Pipelines Research and Development Team at the Sanger Institute. 13 years ago, her PhD included researching improvements to multiplex PCR, an integral method to many of the processes she has since been involved with at Sanger. Discovering this experience would be extremely useful in the midst of a pandemic is something she didn't see coming. Naomi, I would like to welcome you to the Minor Tweak Major Impact podcast. Hi Anita, thanks very much for having me in your podcast. I'm really excited to be here and talk about some of the work that we've been doing recently. Can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and what you're currently working on? Sure. So I've been at the Sanger Institute where I'm working now for 12 years now, so quite a long time. And obviously we're a big genomics research institute. Prior to that, my background is very much as a chemist, so very different to lots of biochemists and biophysicians that come and work here. My undergraduate degree was actually in analytical and environmental chemistry at the University of Surrey. And the head of analytical chemistry there was a really strong personality, very inspiring Neil Ward. And the main thing I got from that undergraduate degree was always to consider accuracy and precision of of any method that I was working with and being super meticulous, having high self-awareness of exactly what I was doing in the lab. And also always looking for any potential sources of bias that I might be bringing into the data. So after my degree in chemistry, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but I love doing method and technology development. I had a big interest in forensics, but I didn't know where to go next. And I didn't really consider myself to be academic material. But one day, shortly after finishing my degree, I was perusing the job section of New Scientists. And that's when I came across a PhD in in the chemistry department at the University of Southampton, which was sponsored by the Forensic Science Service. This really got my attention. And this involved developing a new method for genotyping using multiplex PCR and mass spectrometry. And so my PhD never led me to a career in forensics. I'm not sure I could say that I enjoyed any of the organic synthesis. But what I really did discover was an absolute love of techniques surrounding and including PCR and molecular biology in general. And this is lots of areas I never covered in my undergraduate degree. Towards the latter part of my PhD, I can remember the day when I first came across the Sanger Institute. I'd never heard of it before. And it sounded like a, a really fascinating place to work. And in particular, it's not-for-profit funding and and its open data sharing model really, really appealed to me. So when I saw a job at the Sanger advertised, it was for using a method called Sequinom, which is now GINA, which is genotyping using mass spectrometry, which is basically the technique that I developed, or very similar to a technique I developed during my PhD. It seemed a perfect fit for me. So that's my opening into Sanger. Um, I went for that job and got it. And first of all, it was really, really enjoyable. Loved working, discovering new things, working on them, tweaking on them wherever I could, tweak the methods that I was working on to to get them working as well as possible. But after a relatively short period, there was really nothing left to tweak. And it was just a matter of running the process and churning through samples, which although is absolutely vital and important, Personally, I didn't find it that fulfilling. So at the same time, I, I could see in other teams within Sanger that next generation sequencing was becoming increasingly used. And I could see how genotyping and microarray, microarray, I was also working on the microarray facility, and I could see how inevitably both of these techniques were going to be replaced by next generation sequencing. I did my best to get into the technology development group at the Sanger Institute, and that's where I've been now for nine years. So nine years ago, I joined the technology development group at Sanger, focusing upon the progression of new technologies and protocols within the Institute. And the team has evolved over the years to do this with an ever-growing requirement of the key programs of research which take place in the Institute. And there's been a requirement to handle far larger numbers of samples and diversity of samples. And so this takes me to my current day before COVID-19 arrived. I was uh, supporting the Tree of Life programme, which is a fairly new programme at the the Institute, whose aim is basically the UK-wide initiative to read the genomes of all uh, approximately 60,000 complex species in eukaryotes in the British Isles. And I was supporting the R&D on the 
DNA extraction site just before lockdown. And so I've, I've basically gone from smashing up frozen bits of crickets, and ladybirds, snails and oak leaves, things like that, and extracting their high molecular weight DNA and then taking that through for long read sequencing. And then within a couple of weeks, I, I went to receiving and processing RNA extracts from COVID-19 patients from the nearby hospital at Addenbrooke's. So that's my background and, and how it's changed very recently. That's great. Thank you so much for that introduction. And the reason why I reached out to you is that your team recently published a COVID-19 construction and sequencing protocol. And then I saw a tweet that you posted about that method where you said a change in annealing temperature from 65 degrees Celsius to 63 degrees Celsius recovers Amplicon 64 dropout and reduces variation in coverage. And I thought that was really interesting. Can you please tell us a little little bit more about that particular method and how you discovered that this minor temperature change would make such a major impact on it? Yeah, sure. So the method itself is largely based on the Arctic Network's method to capture the COVID-19 genome. So the method itself, we developed pretty rapidly by dovetailing in that method that had already been um, established with some of the other pipelines that we already had running at the Sanger Institute to convert that to alumina libraries. The RNA is extracted from a sample swap and it undergoes reverse transcription to generate the cDNA. And then this goes into two multiplex PCR reactions to selectively capture the COVID-19 genome away from any human RNA or cDNA that was generated from that sample. And it's a really good, uh, great multiplex PCR design developed by Josh Quick. So we had no involvement in the development of the PCR itself. And it's, it's a tile design which means that the entire genome is captured by overlapping primer pairs. And because these are overlapping, they have to be split into two different reactions to enable amplification of the desired amplicons and to make sure that no part of the COVID sequencing data that's generated is actually derived from the primer sequence and it's from the patient sample. The PCR products from two pools are then combined and we take them through the library prep. So at the Sanger Institute, that's mainly for Illumina. But we have also been using Oxford Nanopore and Pat Bio for some of our R&D work. But from the start of our work on COVID-19, it became clear that we were regularly seeing the dropout of Amplicon 64. But when we first started, it was more a matter of just roll out this out as quickly as possible with the information we had. So we didn't have the time to investigate in a, like the Amplicon 64 dropout. It was more a case of setting it up um, in a high throughput environment and rolling it out. The Sanger Institute is part of the COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium, COG UK, which was created to deliver the large-scale and rapid whole genome virus sequencing to local NHS centres and the UK government. And many of the labs in COG UK are using the same multiplex PCR. So what was interesting is that I thought if the reason we were seeing the 64 Amplicon dropout was because, say, it was missing, it was biological and it wasn't there to capture, we would expect all of the groups in COG UK to see the dropout of Amplicon 64. And what's been great being part of a consortium and is the communication between the members. And one way we do this is through the COG UK Slack channel. And someone on this channel raised that exact question, is anyone else seeing dropout of Amplicon 64? And the answers that followed intrigued me, they got my attention. Because although many did say, yes, we saw this dropout, some totally, some less of coverage for Amplicon 64, but one person said they didn't have a problem. So I thought, well, if one person, one group doesn't have a problem, then surely it isn't biological. And then at the same time, at Sanger, we, we have a side strand of research looking at the generation and sequencing of longer COVID Amplicons and some of the long read sequencing platforms. And some of their early work, where they had primers that spanned but didn't include the primers of 64, they indicated that the dropout region amplified absolutely fine. So this, for me, kind of discounted a biological cause. And at the same time, we've been looking at other methods, tweaking the PCR. So instead of generating the amplicons and then having to ATL and ligate an adapter and then PCR to incorporate uh, the Illumina barcode, I thought it'd be much easier if we can use a five prime common tail sequence. And then after PCR1, using these tailed primers, if we could then amplify off these directly and incorporate barcode at the same time, then this would uh, make library prep much quicker, cheaper. So 
although I haven't got that working that well yet. During the development of those tailed primers, I tried changing the annealing temperature of those and and it works much, much better as I lowered that annealing temperature. So that made me think, well, if it's having such a big effect on the tail primer, it's probably going to have some form of effect on the non-tailed standard Arctic primers. So we could actually answer this question very rapidly within a couple of days. I find quite amazing that we've gone from an idea to knowing if this works well. And then we can credit up to a fantastic mix of teams that we've got working on this at Sanger and the variety of sequencing platforms we have available. At Sanger, we have a large number of Illumina sequencing instruments, but the quickest to generate data is OMT. And whilst we are using Illumina for the bulk COVID sequencing, for our R&D work, we've often been using ONT, MINI and flow cells for much of this method development. So to test the annealing temperature hypothesis, quickly generated the usual PCR outcomes on a gradient thermocycler, made barcoded ONT libraries. We could do this in the space of a day and then sequence overnight, finish the sequencing in the morning and our wonderful bioinformaticians then picked up and analysed the data, generating the AMPTCOM plots by the following lunchtime. And as soon as we saw those plots, it was immediately clear that actually the annealing temperature of 65 was too high for the primers of AMPTCOM 64 to anneal and extend, at least in our thermocyclers. And and we've got quite a few thermocyclers that we're using for this, so to make sure that it was uh, holding up across a few, we tested this on a few more to make sure it held up, and it did. So as soon as I saw that, it was great that we could then quickly share within the COG UK consortium, test a bit further, and then update our protocols IO. That's great. And then so for just to follow up on that, the one team that you said that they didn't have an issue yeah. with the Amplicon 64 dropout, did you ever talk to them? Do you know if they're using like a different temperature for the kneeling too? Or how did you guess that it was related to that? I guess because I've got quite a lot of experience in multiplex PCR, I I already have an awareness that annealing temperature is going to have quite a big impact. And I know everybody's thermocyclers, some have been more calibrated more recently than others, or that's not to say ours are definitely right. There might be a slightly different way that they're calibrated. I think it's reasonable that there'll be some slight variation between different institutes thermocyclers. So what has happened since is that I did have a conversation on a COG UK call, not with the individual that didn't have a problem directly, but since I raised that annealing temperature was the reason 64 was dropping out, others in the group have looked at how else they might address it, because although 63 works absolutely fine for our thermocyclers, if others used it and their thermocycler was already running a bit lower, they would then come into problems if they ran straight 63. So that's why we would suggest that different centres test a range of annealing temperatures for themselves and the thermocycle they're going to use. Or there, there's other ways to solve this that I know other members of Coggy K are looking at, such as using an annealing temperature that ramps down, and that can solve it as well. Right. That's very interesting. What are really the next goals for the COVID-19 research community in general, and what will your team specifically focus on working on next? So, I mean, in the whole research community in general, I'm sure there's many, many different aspects of COVID-19 that's being looked into, but I can talk more specifically to my field in the method development. I think what will be really interesting is that there are many slight variations that different groups are using to capture and sequence the COVID genome. And this can be in terms of, say, the RNA extraction itself and the methods for that, the RT enzyme. And the RT can either be initiated using the random hexamers or it might be COVID specific. And then it's not always then captured through PCR, it might be bait capture. And then once we have that COVID genome captured and amplified, the library preparation itself can differ. And that can be whether it's going on Illumina or whether it's going on ONT. And I think what would be really interesting is what is the bottom line question of all these variables are, is how well are we able to accurately call variation? And this is particularly if we start to look at intra-host diversity. So I think it would be really interesting when we're able to to run a really true comparison of all of these different methods. And as part of the consortium, we're hoping to actually answer these questions in the near future because uh, we're having a highly accurate synthetic RNA construct being made, uh, which contains known variants. 
And so by knowing exactly what variants should be in specific places, we'll be able to ascertain how well each of these different techniques are doing at calling this variant. Right. That's very interesting. And then shifting gears a little bit into a different direction, one thing I wanted to cover on is, so we've been seeing that the scientific community really has been and really still is very much collaborating on COVID-19 and open sharing of scientific data happens, I think, much more and faster than we see it with any other research topics, really. What do you think, what kind of impact do you think the COVID-19 pandemic might have on the broader scientific community in terms of open sharing of data and also rapid sharing of data? Yeah, I, I hope all the lessons that we have learned from this really stick with us all. One of the re big reasons I like working at Sanger is because we have a policy of rapid and open data sharing. So we can make as quick advancement uh, for the benefit of all as, as possible. And this pandemic has encouraged a greater amount of cross-team work across the Institute itself, even though we already strive to do this, even more so through collaboration, say through COG UK. And I think for me personally, there are certain techniques and methods that I've worked on, and it's often we're very, very busy using them, awake and then say we're, we're meeting the requirements of a faculty group internally and we've generated the method, we're generating their data and then we wait for them to publish and that can kind of include the methodology. And all of that can take quite a long time. And But often I think it would have benefited if we had quickly put that method up, I say, on Protocols.io so others could use it sooner rather than waiting for, say, a year down the line for that publication. So I think personally, I would definitely be sharing more of the methods that I'm working on. And I hope that spans out to the broader scientific community that they do that also. And I guess perhaps the relationships and networks that have fostered as a result of the pandemic will continue and then overlap into other areas of research. That's great. And just to wrap up, I know we did talk a lot about your experiences with developing methods and optimizing methods, but just to summarize, do you have any additional thoughts, suggestions, any advice for anyone that you can give that is currently developing or optimizing methods or any other insights that you would like to share with our listeners today? Yeah, sure. I would say Don't always assume the method that you've been given or you see published is the best way to do something. Often there are tweets that you might think, actually, why do they not do that like that? And actually, you can change it. So I guess have the confidence and use previous experiences to apply to new methods that you're running would be one thing. And the other would be to always maintain high observation of what you're doing. I'm not perfect and I've made plenty of mistakes when running protocols over the years, but I'd like to think I notice and, and make notes. And as I said before, on several occasions, it's resulted in things working better. So mistakes are no bad thing. We should definitely be open with ourselves when we make them and admit them to others. And the other thing is don't undervalue your unique experience and the importance of what you're doing. When I explain the effect of the 65 to 63 tweet to someone else at Sanger, who's a bioinformatician, he said, as a non-biologist, I found this work utterly fascinating. And the idea that a few decimals of a degree make such a difference is mind-blowing to me. And that was really resonated because to me, it was something that was like, oh, surprising and it's good, but it's not really that amazing. But it's good to bear in mind that others who don't do this on a day-to-day basis really value that experience of what we're doing. Right. Those are great advices. Thank you so much for sharing those. And our last question, as always, is a fun question and any answers are allowed. But if you were allowed to make a wish for a tool in the lab that would make your life easier or just in general life of researchers easier, what would that be? Yeah, so this goes back to what I was working on before COVID-19 research happened. So going back to the tree of life work where we're trying to extract high molecular weight DNA and RNA out of every uh, eukaryote that comes our way. It's so incredibly challenging. So if you could magic something up, which is fully automated, which took any sample and out came high molecular weight DNA and RNA, that would basically make that entire program work far, far easier. Yeah, that sounds like an awesome tool. <laughs> I like it. Naomi, thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your stories and insights on the Minor Tweak Major Impact podcast. 
Thank you. This is your host, Anita, and we look forward to being with you for our next episode. This program was produced by H Media. We'll see you soon.